too. So welcome everyone to uh, the Interagency Task Force on Israeli Arab Issues uh, briefing on issues and priorities related to Arab society in uh, ahead of Israel's third election cycle. We're very, very fortunate to have with us today Ali Kudnitsky, researcher and expert on Arab society for the Israeli Israel Democracy Institute and Tel Aviv University, and Maisam Jaljuli, chairman, chairwoman of uh, Naamat, a women's organization focused on labor rights, who is also a leading figure and board member in organizations promoting workers and democratic rights. The last year and a little bit and a bit more uh, of consecutive elections in Israel saw significant fluctuations in discourse within Arab society and regarding Jewish Arab political participation. From dissolution of the joint list and divisive campaigning uh, ahead of the, the April's election in 2019, to a reunified joint list and unprecedented steps by both Jewish and Arab political leaders towards greater cooperation last September. Today, as we head towards March and third elections, uh, the, we have questions about what the discourse and issues are characterizing the third cycle, and how come discussion of greater cooperation was possible in the last round and yet seems quite a distant reality already today. What else should we be paying attention to to understand trends and realities related to Jewish Arab political relations? We will hear first uh, a few minutes of overview and main points from each of our speakers and then open it up to questions from the audience. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen uh, of the webinar screen to submit questions as we go and I will um, do my best to select and present them to the speakers. So please, with no further ado, Alec, would you please begin with your uh, main overview? Thank you, Rilon, and uh, good yeah. afternoon, everybody. Do you hear me and see me? Yes, okay. I hear and see you, I think. Okay. Um, so, as you know, in about uh, 10 days or so, we are heading to a third election in a row uh, within the course of one year. And um, I think that this mm. is the time to shed some light on uh, what, what we've seen so far. In the September election, just uh, to uh, remind us all, we witnessed an increase in the turnout in the Arab sector by 10%. I think uh, we're having some trouble with your audio, are you? You don't hear me? I, I do. You're on? Can you hear me? I think that's little. I, I hear you, but, and I see you as well. Everything works from in my end. It's my end. Does it work for you? I hear you now. Let's hope, let's hope the participants are hearing. Um, okay. Feel free to send me, uh, to all the attendees, feel free to let me know by chat if you're able to hear us. Okay. So, okay. as I mentioned before, uh, in the last election in September, just a couple of months ago, we witnessed an increase in the turnout in the Arab sector, reaching a 59% at all. Um, I would like to put it in some proportion because I heard several voices praising the uh, achievement of the joint list, winning again the 13 seats. But if we examine the uh, process, the political process that we've witnessed in the last uh, two decades, we can see that the 59% uh, turnout is much like the average turnout in this period. It is around 57. So I think that the uh, political potential is uh, still there, is still unreached, and maybe there is a chance to, for the joint list or for the Arab public to achieve more and gain more in the forthcoming uh, election. Uh, but the issue here is that um, the, the issue here is that the political parties lost some power in the street. Meaning that uh, today I heard someone says that uh, every day an Arab citizen wakes up and he feels like as if he were an autonomous political entity 
meaning that uh, is not necessarily mobilized by uh, political action by the parties, by, but on, on his own individual uh, needs and aspirations. Uh, the issue here is that there are four political parties actually represented today in the Knesset, uh, Arab parties, and some Arab representatives in the Jewish Zionist parties, and the turnout did not exceed the 60% uh, limit. And I think, I believe that the actual trigger to increase uh, this turnout is actually outside of the uh, Arab political arena. And to put it in a very, to, just to illustrate in a short sentence, I would say that if it was for uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to make the Arab voters to go out and vote uh, using his anti-Arab uh, political campaign, electoral campaign, and the Arab voters uh, responded by going out and vote, I believe that uh, this time uh, the, uh, se the, century, the, the deal of the century by uh, Donald Trump will create the same, same effect. Meaning that the Arab voters need some outside or external uh, trigger to make them go out and vote and to demonstrate that, well, we are citizens and you cannot disregard our political participation. You cannot disregard us as legitimate citizens. This is uh, number one. This is the first point that I want to, uh, to relate to. And another thing is the question is whether there is still a joint a Jewish Arab political cooperation. Because if we take a look, if we examine the latest or most recent statements by both politicians, Jewish and Arab politicians, I think that if there was one thing that they have agreed upon is that there is no actually a chance for a political cooperation, at least as far as the uh, electoral campaign is concerned, there is no a real and genuine chance for such a cooperation. We heard statements by uh, the leaders of Blue and White, uh, Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid saying, well, they do not see any such cooperation with the joint list as a realistic option. And on the other hand, we hear uh, similar statements on the, the, on the part of the joint list, uh, heard by uh, Ahmad Tibi, who is the spokesman of, of, the, of the joint list, and Ayman Odi, saying that in the current circumstances, there is, no real, there is not a real chance of integrating uh, the joint list uh, as an outside block, political block, uh, as a safety net for a possible government led by a uh, Benny Gantz, Blue and White Party. And there are, there are several reasons for that. Um, number one is the fact that actually Blue and White is perceived as a, a Likud uh, version uh, two. Uh, like uh, the, same, the same thing, but with other, with other, with another dress. Uh, especially in light of the support the fact that Blue and White supported the, the vision uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Trump's plan, uh, like uh, and Israel's sovereignty over the, uh, over the Jordan Valley uh, and, and, and the like. So there's no, there's no big difference between, between the two uh, leading uh, Jewish parties. Um, number two, I think that uh, if a typical Arab citizen is looking for a political uh, effectiveness uh, and that to make sure that his voice is heard and he looks at the uh, political landscape, he sees or he finds out that actually there are no realistic candidates integrated in the Jewish Zionist parties. Uh, Meretz, who was once the, 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 you know, the, the leader of or a model of a joint, uh, joint party for Arabs and Jews, although it is a Jewish Zionist party, but still uh, highlighting the cooperation between Jews and Arabs, merits integrated into Labour and Gesher, and uh, Isabi Fredj, the Arab candidate, is ranked only in the 10th slot in this list. And according to recent polls, 
is not expecting to be elected the Knesset. And also, and the right-wing parties, including Blue and White, uh, we see some Arab candidates, but they do not necessarily represent the mainstream, uh, polit the, the, the political mainstream in the Arab street. So I see that uh, Jews and Arabs to, today on, on the current political landscape uh, do not necessarily go hand in hand together. But uh, if I have two, two more minutes to, to, sum, to summarize my, my, uh, my, my, my opinion right now, I think that we have to take into consideration that we are on a continuous electoral campaign going on for one year. And political statesmen during the electoral campaign is one thing, while political conduct after election day is another thing. And I know, according to recent public opinion polls, that the Arab public aspires for such a political cooperation and to be effective on the political arena. arena. Uh, and maybe we're going to see more of the practical cooperation between Jews and Arabs after uh, election day. Thank you. Thank you for, for a, a good start and overview of where we are. My son, from your perspective, how are the circumstances ahead of the third elections different or the same? Or what responses do you have um, to fill in to Ali's overview about the interests of Arab voters and the possibilities for cooperation before and or after the elections? I agree to everything that Arik said. Can I, can I not agree to you, Arik? <laughs> I actually, I, yeah, I think that, you know, the, um, uh, the cooperation now before the election seems to be, you know, unrealistic because every party has its own agenda right now. And it seems to be that, you know, cooperation is not one of the agendas that a lot of uh, parties uh, are willing to. Um, as I, as Alex said, the blue and white uh, were very clear this time that they want no cooperation between them and between the joint list, and they are very afraid to even talk about you know the joint list because they think that they should be more right wing than Netanyahu. Actually, Netanyahu yesterday started a campaign, uh, a positive campaign in the in the Arab society, and it was really ironic campaign for me. But I think he said he was interviewing uh, to Panet, one of the uh, very famous uh, websites, and he said that he is interesting in the Arab voters, and he wants three mandates, the good mandates from the Arab voters, which is very ironic. And he used the issue of Hajj, of you know, uh, visiting Mecca, which is very important for all Muslims. And he was proud that he's getting um, a visa for Muslims in Israel in, uh, to visit Mecca. And you, you should see what happened today in, uh, in social media. You know, people dressed, uh, having Netanyahu dressed with the Hajj clothes. Uh, uh, near Mecca, uh, photos in Kaaba, in Mecca, and it was very, <laughs> very interesting. But I think this is ironic, but, um, and I think that, you know, I'm so conscious, I think that we should wait for the last day because uh, I don't know what, you know, surprises Netanyahu is making for us on the election day because he is really afraid of the number of turnout of the Arab Bay um, voters. And I think that he understood that, you know, the Trump Netanyahu plan, the century plan, and the whole talks about the triangle and, you know, uh, swapping lands and people in the triangle, I think uh, it's, it will play a major role. Uh, it will play a major role on uh, getting the vote out and turn out of the voters, as Eric said, because uh, people now uh, are much more motivated by this issue than other issues. If the last election, the issue of you know integration and the issue of being part of the political power in Israel, 
Uh, what's the issue? I think right now the main issue is the whole uh, um, uh, Netanyahu Trump plan and especially uh, the, uh, you know, the part of the plan which deals with the, the, is the Arab Israeli citizens. So, um, yes, this is an, extra, uh, an external trigger to go to vote, but it's a very, very important time uh, this time. You know, regardless of um, cooperation between uh, the analysis of Eric was very, very clear, and I agree with it. Uh, today, in the political sphere, we have no cooperation at all. Even we, have, we don't have candidates, you know, in, uh, you know, in the parties. Uh, there is no Arab candidates in the parties. I saw someone who uh, 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 um, just wrote here that uh, Isau Fred is number 11, but number 11 is not realistic to enter the Knesset. So there is no Arab uh, candidate and also in Kohol Lavan, you know, uh, we, we have a Druzi uh, candidate, which is a little bit different. And it seems to be that, uh, you know, we are um, very um, segregated in, 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 in our uh, political sphere. But the question and the major question about cooperation will be after the election. And I think that we need a public pressure on that issue. The public need to influence the politicians. That means that if we are, if we will have um, um, a, a major public uh, movement or, you know, mobilize movement uh, that mobilizes people to influence their uh, parties from both sides, the Arab sides and the Jewish side, I think that it will influence after the election. And you're not know, talking about what will happen in, in the coalition after the, ele the election. I think that um, things that are happening now are not necessarily will happen after the election. I suppose that blue and white and joint list will talk immediately after you know uh, having the results of the election. If really blue and white will be the biggest. Uh, um, party after the election. And, and I think that they have no chance. They should have the joint list with them if they want to uh, maintain a government and to be, if, if Gantz wants to be the prime minister, the next prime minister, he should do it. And he knows that. You know, I think that th there is no chance or, uh, that uh, this cooperation will not happen after the election. And if I want to talk about people, I know other real people who really uh, will go or not go to vote, I think that the election day itself will be very crucial. That means that if the joint list and the activists will manage to go to the houses, you know, knock out the door and really getting people get out and go to vote, it will be a, um, a, a huge success. Uh, so it will, it depends if the joint list, the list is ready to do uh, something like that or not ready. And you know, I'm a little bit skeptical if they, if they are ready to do that because I think that their campaign is right now very weak campaign. They are not say, um, really reaching the people, and sometimes it seems to be that they assume that you know, anyway, the people will go to vote, and you cannot assume this in in, in election. You need to go to the people and to convince them to go out and vote. Thank you, thank you both. I'm going to open it up and invite people to start submitting questions. We have some coming in. One from uh, Alan Divak, thank you. I would love to hear what the speakers think about the joint lists advertising campaigns in Russian, Haredi, and Ethiopian communities. Is it like Netanyahu thinking he can get Arab votes or is it different? You want me to start? Sure. Okay. Um, I heard the Ayman Ode is the leader of the joint list uh, one thing that he's trying to do in the last couple of months is not just to bring the component, the four components of the list together and act as a united uh, political faction in the Knesset or outside the Knesset as well, but also to position 
the joint list as the real genuine leftist party in Israel. Meaning they, it, it, they appeal and they call for all citizens, uh, Arabs and, and Jews, in order to create or set up uh, the real left bloc, political left bloc in Israel after election day. So I was, uh, it, it was quite funny to see some uh, political ads of the joint list uh, for in Russian and, and, you know, trying to broaden the scope and uh, try to appeal to new target audience. Uh, but I was not surprised at all about that. Uh, one thing that is missing in a joint list is really the the profile of Jewish represented representation. Uh, today, the joint list includes only one um, important represent uh, representative, Ofer Kasif, is uh, a Jew on behalf of Hadash. Of course, we have to bear in mind that the joint list actually is a composition of four political parties, and it is a mixture between uh, former communists and Islamists and nationalists and, and the sort and the like. Uh, but still, Ayman Oder is targeting the uh, broad, the general Jewish public to position, as I mentioned, to position joint list as a left, the real left party, especially in light of the fact that Meretz is the, the, the brand name Meretz has suffered a great blow in the Arab street following the September election. So I'm not surprised about that. I just want to add to what Arik said that 70% of the Arabs, you know, um, uh, represent themselves as leftists. So if we want to compare, you know, it seems to be that 40% of leftists in Israel are Arabs. So um, I think that is, uh, this is very important. You know, uh, I think that the component and the um, advertising to the, uh, actually to the former Soviet Union uh, uh, um, citizens, uh, Russian citizens in Israel, I think it's very important because a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, even Arab politicians in Khadash have studied in Russia, in the former Soviet Union, and they were, they're well-known Russian. And a lot of them are also married to Russian women. So, um, I think that uh, it is, you know, uh, it's never too late and it's time also to have and to point to a new uh, voters and a new sectors that uh, can really share, you know, the civic uh, issues that the joint list is dealing with. And let's not forget, politics, it doesn't mean only, you know, the uh, conflict between Palestine and Israel and equality for, for Arab uh, citizens in Israel. It means also social justice it's for, for all people who live in Israel. And Ayman Audi has joined demonstration of the Ethiopians before. This is not the first time that he does so. And if we look at the history, Hadash as party uh, uh, had contained a lot of Mizrahis, uh, in uh, in Khadash, and uh, we had also candidates uh, once from uh, the Mizrahi. Uh, um, uh, um, why I forgot its name, uh, but it's um, uh, a Mizrahi uh, uh, organization that really was very famous in Israel back in the 90s. So this is, you know, this is not the first time. It was a little bit funny, you know, to read the um, advertising in Yiddish, but... <laughs> and I think also, uh, you know, of course we will not have a Haredi uh, uh, voters, but uh, we know well that uh, the joint list and Haredi parties are, uh, are well known as, you know, uh, cooperating together in the Knesset and fighting for yeah. civil issues. And this is very important, let's not forget. We have a related question um, on, online, which says that on a Haaretz podcast, I heard that in the last election, Israeli Jewish voters gave the joint list one mandate, uh, and they said that in this election, it could likely be two. Do you agree with this analysis? I, I would say that is a wishful thinking. According to a real and in-depth analysis that I have made 
following the September and actually all the analysis that I make uh, after every uh, election cycle. Uh, indeed, there are several thousand votes on Jewish Jewish localities. You, you know, you know, you cannot you cannot actually separate between uh, Jews and Arabs, especially in in, in mixed cities, Jew, Jewish Arab mixed cities. But if we take a look at the uh, broader landscape in Israel, uh, and we see uh, set of localities with, with, with which are Jewish, actually, they gain several thousand. I think it was five or six thousand. Uh, this is far, far more than one mandate. And the issue here is not quantity, but quality. I think that the fact that the Joint List gained uh, significant support, and it is significant support on Jewish localities, uh, I think this is a message in itself, uh, regardless of the fact whether the, this equals a mandate or not in the center, in, in, in the Knesset. Uh, Ofer Kasif, I think he, he gained a half half a mandate uh, last last, uh, last elections. I don't think that I don't think that uh, one mandate is feasible, let alone two mandates. But I mentioned, I, I said before, this is a this is the quality that matters here. Um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit about uh, the the ongoing challenges the joint list has in balancing its own internal differences between Balag and Hadash and how this affects its capacity or is it affecting what's the discourse in Arab society about these differences and uh, about different voices and different ideologies and whether it's affecting its capacity to present itself as a party for um, the left in Israel in general. Um, I think, you know, uh, if you go to the man or the woman in the street or in the Arab society, a lot of them don't know the differences between the, the, the four parties, you know, because for the people, they are fi all fighting for issues, for the same issues, for equality, for social justice, for, you know, uh, uh, and for the Palestinian case. So, yes, sometimes people can really, you know, see the difference between Hadash or Balad and the Islamic movement because, you know, the Islamic movement uh, is really, you know, um, a, gover um, a party that uh, have some religious, uh, another religious issues that uh, Hadash and Balad and TB also don't have. Uh, but, you know, for people in the streets, they really pushed for this unification. And they were very happy about it back in 2015, and they are very happy about it right now. And we saw that they punished them when they split in the uh, September, in the, the April election. So they really punished them because they didn't want to vote. And it was a kind of punishment for these all parties. But no, there is a lot of differences. For me, you know, as a political activist that knows what happened in there are a lot of differences right now. Nobody talks about these differences, but of course, after the election, it will uh, be on the surface again, and we will see these, uh, you know, arguments about the different uh, ways. Uh, because you know, I'm an Audi, and I'm an Audi's way, or um, is not, you know, let's say that Ballad is not so acceptable of what Ayman Audi uh, says and, you know, and his attempts of integration and being part of the power. But uh, I think right now what, what, make it, what makes it happen that Ayman Audi is gaining a lot of popularity, popularity in the street, popularity between the people. And I think that the others can see that. And meanwhile, there are silence. They will not remain silence after the election. This is my, uh, my view. So if you tell me that I, I can see that the joint list is something for a long term, no. I don't see the joint list as, you know, as a coalition that will continue for the long term. It also depends of what we said before about the efforts of um, having a joint Arab-Jewish politics and the, the pressure that maybe people can have on these parties, especially Hadash. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Ali, do you want to add to that question? The way yes. that, yeah. Well, I think, I think that 
just to remind us all, the Joint List was established in 2015. It was actually dismantled uh, in 2019. And during the course of this year, it had been given a second and a second, second chance to actually to prove itself as, as a political entity. And uh, I think that, you know, it, it, it is an, an issue for political, political fate uh, and that, that they had been given a second chance in, uh, in September. And they're, they're drawing momentum uh, in the last couple of months. So the internal universities, I think they, are not, they do not matter uh, as today. And maybe, maybe they will stay on the low, low fire uh, during during the term of the Knesset, assuming that we are going to finally have one uh, following these elections. Uh, but, uh, well, it was not for them to raise the political threshold. It was for Victor Lieberman who did it, and the Arab public responded, and the Arab politicians responded by establishing this political framework, and they're going I assume, I think that they are going to increase their power to at least 14 mandates, uh, according to my humble estimations. Uh, so I think that, yes, political, there are political diversities and dividing lines between the four components. There are, no, no, one, no one ignores these, these divisions. Uh, we've seen an illustration just in the last, following the last election campaign when three out of the four parties went to Ruby Rivlin to recommend Benny Gantz, uh, Benny Gantz for, on, on Benny Gantz to, to, uh, to be prime minister. Uh, so it, it, is, it is an issue, but not as prominent as, as we think it is right now. Um, thank you. There, there's questions also about uh, get out the vote efforts that I want to address, but I also have questions. I want to dig a little bit more into the campaign that Netanyahu just launched in Arab society. I know that, my son, you referenced this speaking about um, the jokes that took place on social media about this, but, I'm, but on a serious level, what do you think, how are people, do you think that this kind of campaign in Arabic can be impactful? Um, all cynicism aside, is there, does it gain traction is there a discourse behind the, um, the, the humor uh, that, that might be easy for us to talk about in this context? And then the question about the get out the vote efforts is, um, uh, what do you think about get out of the vote efforts of organizations like um, the coalition anchored in the Arab Center for Alternative Planning? Are they effective? Um, what are some of their activities now? Are these ramping up towards election day? And what do we see? Uh, are, are they doing anything differently this round relative to the last rounds? So those two questions, if you'd like, however you two, you two would like to address them. Okay, so um, I'll start from Netanyahu. That I, I said, look, these attempts are not, you know, people are not buying these attempts, let's say. People, you know, are so clever, you know. Someone who all the time, all his political life had one thing in mind, you know, to delegitimize the, the Arab society, to delegitimize the representative of Arab society. You know, people will never forget what happened in 2000, election 2015, when he threatened his voters from Arab voters, which are rushing to, uh, uh, to the Kalfi to vote. And, you know, um, people are smart. So these attempts are not working. I don't know if Netanyahu, you know, um, I don't know what is the reason that he is now attempting to the Arab Bay society. I think it has to do with his efforts to make peace with the surrounding uh, uh, Arab and Muslim countries. And he said that in the interview last night with, uh, with Bennett that, I am the prime minister who is making peace with the surrounding, you know, Arab countries. I don't know if he's not aware of or of that that all these attempts are, you know, are uh, are not acceptable in the Arab society. You know, uh, the Arabs here in in Israel are, you know, they hate Netanyahu and they hate also uh, uh, the Saudi Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, they, they share the same hatred for these people. 
because they are they they think and you know truly uh, that they they are attempting to uh, vanish the Palestinian issue and they are you know having coalition with Trump in order to um, to affect negatively the the Palestinian issue. So I think these attempts are not working. They are they will not work. We all the time have and we all the time had these politicians uh, or these activists, political activists who are Likud activists. And they are, you know, all these activists are, you know, um, are, they have no influence, you know, on voters in, in, in their uh, villages and towns. Uh, it's only, you know, I can believe that someone will, buy, uh, will vote for Likud if he has some promises, and, uh, you know, um, some to, I don't know, to find job, to find work, something like that. And this is the only way that uh, they could can gain uh, uh, voters from uh, from Arabs. And even the people who really want to vote Likud, they will not, you know, come in public and say, "I will vote Likud." <laughs> so, um, uh, for the regardless, the second question, what um, what was the second okay. question? Can you remind me? Get out the vote efforts, and I guess I'll I'll expand uh, the question a little bit. You know, yeah. uh, the question was whether. Is, yeah, I think this. Uh, all these efforts are very if because they are really, you know, uh, helping, you know, uh, people to decide and your vote. They, we have, a, we are facing now an intensive campaigns. Not only the campaign that you mentioned, but we have other campaigns. Uh, uh, the Abraham Initiative have a campaign. Sikui have a campaign, uh, and uh, other uh, organizations. Uh, and also, uh, I know that uh, uh, also websites in the Arab society have their own campaigns. These are very important because, uh, and they really, I think that uh, because that the joint list is not having a really a large and a wide, a large wide campaign and an intensive campaign, so it helps. I don't know really, I'm not inside the campaigns this time. I don't know what really are the, uh, you know, the strategies, the strategies of getting the vote out this time. But I think regardless of the campaign of, you know, um, uh, everybody is going to vote. Uh, they are using the same strategies because they worked at the last election. And what, I've, what I heard that they are having an extra effort also knock, in knocking out the doors, you know, really getting to the, uh, to the, to the houses and convincing people to, they are having a work of door to door work. So, um, and there are some organizations that are issuing the issue of, you know, violence in the Arab society and having solution for the violence uh, and crime issues. We have a campaigns that talks about, you know, about land. We, there, are, we, there are also campaigns that giving them, uh, the people the chance to talk about how to be an Arab in Israel. And it's very viral and people really see that. So there are various campaigns. I love all of these campaigns. I wish, uh, <laughs> I wish us success. Can you expand how the campaign is how to be an Arab in Israel? Ah, it's um, um, you know, it's I mean, it's it's like a challenge, a challenge. Uh, it's it's a campaign which led by Sikui. It's a challenge of uh, um, you know um, having people uh, talking for one minute about how to be, how is it to be an Arab in Israel in one minute, and a lot of young people are participating. It's very, you know, interesting to see how people see themselves as Arabs in Israel. And a lot of them are talking, you know, about their daily life in Israel and, you know, about the um, a situation that they face on the uh, basis of the day life issues. Thank you. Ali, do you want to add to that before I add an, another element to the question? About the popular initiatives to increase the turnout? About Get Out the Vote initiatives, uh, their effectiveness, and then also about, you know, the first question was about this uh, the strange phenomenon of, of Netanyahu now um, campaigning in Arab society after having such um, strong uh, campaigning, uh, uh, different messages in his first campaigns. 
Well, as my son mentioned before, there was a coalition of 10 NGOs uh, that aimed to increase the turnout in, in the September election. And uh, they recruited some, some 600 volunteers, uh, young people mainly, that uh, stood in the streets uh, and the junctions and uh, tried to, uh, to sign the, uh, the, just the public that they're, they're going to vote. And I know they, uh, they gained some 50,000 signatures, uh, like the certificates, like that we, yes, we are going out uh, to vote on election day. So it had, it had a momentum, <clears throat> uh, it had and created, <clears throat> sorry, it created some effect. Also, we know, <clears throat> we know uh, in the September elections and, and now that uh, there are some statements, statements uh, on the part of uh, uh, prominent Arab mayors. Uh, I just received a short uh, video clip with Ali Salam uh, greeting the Arab public and encouraging them to go out and vote. It's very important. It is important for, for, for the joint list and the Arab public in general. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the Givald campaign, the help and uh, go out and vote campaign, uh, the actual campaign is taking place in the closing two hours of the election day. And much is related to how the, the big parties, the, the, like the, the large Jewish parties will relate to, uh, to the Arab, Arab vote in, in this upcoming election. Uh, I said that in September it worked on the contrary, uh, on the opposite side for Netanyahu. Uh, he did not. He did not reach uh, his his goal. Actually, he motivated the Arab public to go out and vote, uh, which leads me to to the second point here. That um, uh, I'm I'm not surprised of the fact that he's trying to reach out uh, to the Arab public and uh, and you know promote uh, the typical uh, electoral campaign that well. I've done to uh, I've done these measures to to strengthen Israel ties with the Arab world, and I'm I'm very well connected to this region, to the Middle East, and uh, maybe this there is a certain target audience that uh, will will comply and and okay will vote to to the good. Uh, but the issue here is uh, both the Likud and Blue and White, the issue here is that they are both trying to reach out to directly to the Arab citizen. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, and I heard it from, from Netanyahu and Benny Gantz as well, that uh, we, we, we do not see, Benny Gantz said so, that uh, he rules out a political cooperation with the joint place, but he doesn't rule out a cooperation or a political representation to the Arab public at large. And uh, the, the thing is here that uh, if we take, if we examine a close look and uh, examining the findings of public opinion polls conducted throughout this continuous electoral campaign in the course of the one year here, uh, the conclusion is that the Arab public will vote to Arab parties and try to be effective through these Arab parties. But if the Jewish large, the Jewish parties would appeal to the regular Arab citizen. They would actually motivate him to go out and vote, but they will vote for Arab parties. Well, mm. it sounds a bit uh, strange, but, uh, but there's no direct relationship or direct vote in the Arab public to Jewish parties. Uh, aside of the uh, regular target audience as the Druze that traditionally the Druze vote uh, for Jewish parties. But actually the Druze, because uh, of the nationalist at law, and they voted, uh, most of the Druze were, were voting for Likud, but now we saw that in the last election that they are voting more for blue and white. And this is, yeah. you know, this is the difference that the nation state law have done to the Druze, that, uh, you know, um, they are moving towards uh, blue and white and other parties rather than the Likud. Yes, yes, but one, one thing is here that, you know, I, I brought social media 
and um, I'm interested in seeing how, how you know the regular the regular citizen is trying to to have his attitude uh, heard. And uh, the, the Jews, there's a large criticism among the Jewish society with regards to the leading Jewish parties. But at the end of the day, they say, well, what other option do we have? What other option do we have? Uh, this is a, some kind of a political tradition. So this is the issue here. So I'm curious, there was in the last several elections where efficacy was seen as the main interest of Arab voters. Still, throughout this entire cycle, the research shows that Arab voters want influence and Arab voters want efficacy. It was pretty easy at the time to see how um, the joint list's messages responded to this idea. We're going to be an influential party. We're going to take part. We're going to be uh, part of making decisions in this country. Um, and maybe now we see uh, also the Jewish parties taking uh, notes from that playbook by, by um, reaching out directly to the Arab voter. But what is the messaging of, after the deal of the century, um, and after the, the talk of, of direct cooperation seems to be not, uh, both parties have stepped back from that, what is the message of the joint list, what is the message of Arab political leaders to the Arab public? Uh, today and is it still anchored on efficacy? What's the tone? It's still the same message. It's still the same. Message. The message of being influential, the message of being part of a political power. It's it's the same message that they used the last election, and they are using their efforts, uh, you know, in um, in uh, preventing some uh, laws, some you know, uh, racist or some dis discriminative laws, like the the Kaminitz law. I don't know if you know about the Kaminitz law, and you know, and other laws. And you know, and the, the issue of fighting against violence and crime in the Arab society, and you know, had, had yeah, held. They really talk about having some uh, um, uh, effective uh, strategies to fight crime within the Knesset. So the influential and you know, gaining power is still you know the main. Uh, a strategy for the joint list sure. and I want to add that uh, now if, if we, we talked about the last election if we talked about joining the government though they are talking about being the third biggest uh, uh, party in the Knesset and that means that uh, we will be the head of the opposition Ayman Odi we will be will be the head of the opposition and this is you know this is something that you cannot ignore the head of oppositions have a lot of uh, you know um, uh, um, um, uh, um, national uh, rule in, in, uh, in not only in the Knesset but in other issues so I think that the message now is we will be the head of the opposition if something you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, important. Um, Ari, can, can I add something? Yes, of course. Yes, okay. Um, I want to add two things. Number one is that the a political campaign is very plain and simple because the public understands plain and simple messages. The message is clear. We would like to gain 15 to 16 seats. Without your votes, we cannot do it. So the public needs to understand the direct correlation between the actual vote and the desired result. So another thing is that the political, the, the, the political program deals with issues, the burning issues that preoccupies the Arab public. The number one issue here is crime and violence. Uh, this is like a feasible or something tangible uh, targets that the, the our public can understand that this is the desired result of the political action which is going out and vote. This is number one. The second issue here is that um, it's an easy task for, this is a general remark, it is not an easy task for a national minority uh, party to maneuver between the desire to be a large party and the 
actual ability to take part in the governing coalition. Uh, you know, for, for each party to play a significant role in politics, it, had, it has to meet two conditions. And the number one is that to be relevant, and the joint list is relevant. It is expected to be, to be again, the third largest faction in the Knesset. And number two is to be legitimate. And I mean, to, to, to be considered as legitimate partners. But if they go out, if they go in and join the coalition, they might lose some of the popular support. This is a paradox, but uh, if we examine the situation of the joint list, we can understand why. Because I said, and we know that it is a mixture of, of various political and ideological streams in the Arab uh, public. And uh, some, some of them do not support the issue of uh, joining into the coalition. And the Arab public at large is quite reluctant about that. Is quite reluctant about that, uh, especially in light of the uh, political developments in the last months. So the goal is to, as myself said, the goal is to achieve as many seats in the future Knesset as possible. This is a very simple pen and simple message. And after that, uh, the joint list leaders said that they, they, do, not, they do not desire to be, to be uh, uh, an integral part in the government. After that is to play a significant role in the Knesset. Thank you. That makes, uh, that makes sense. We, I'm going to give one last opportunity for any questions from the attendees. And then um, if none come in, then I would love to spend the last few minutes that we have Diving in a little bit to this deal of the century, because that caused so much reactions. Uh, uh, related to the elections, I'm curious about um, the influence. We spoke a little bit earlier about the influence on potential voter turnout. I'm curious if that's really concentrated in the triangle or something that all of Arab society has got left behind. Just to speak a little bit about um, how uh, there was definitely strong protests against the, the the, the deal is and the transfer clause and how representative that is of the underlying discourse um, within in the wider Arab community. My son, I think um, we heard speech speech by you go viral. Uh, okay, so um, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm you know I live in that triangle, so this deal connects to me directly. So you know, I'm yeah. uh, one of these people. <laughs> I said, I'm not ready to give up on you. <laughs> no, you're not giving up on me, yeah? Ah, same with us. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, actually, you are talking now, and we are planning a, uh, a tomorrow morning, we are planning a march from Kfar Saba to Jal Julia, from Kfar Saba, and uh, to the uh, nearest uh, Arab uh, village, Jal Julia, which is in the triangle. It's uh, a march with, uh, uh, led it by uh, Omdim Biyakhat standing together. Uh, and it will start tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning and we will go by walking to, uh, to Jal Julia. Hello. Yeah, I was connected, it's okay? Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's also a, an attempt to say to people that we are in this together, that because, you know, Jewish Arab and Arab will march to Jal Julia tomorrow. And, you know, it's also uh, another step after the biggest demonstration that was held in Tel Aviv. It was three, three weeks ago. And um, these attempts, I think, also helps uh, Arab people to, to understand that they are not alone, you know, facing the Trump Netanyahu deal. Uh, and they are also as having a support from uh, Jewish people. Uh, and as Eric said, uh, a lot of Jewish people uh, told us all the time that we are not going to let this happen. To tell you that there are fears, yes, there are a lot of fears. And there, you know, it, I can say about two different things. People see, no, that will not happen. You know, it's uh, so um, unlikely to happen. But in the same way, people think that it's now becoming, you know, not only a talk from the right wing, the extremist right wing, the politicians, it's now a part of a deal between the, the you know, the most influential country in the world and Israel. So 
there is a fear and there is a real fear in, in the Arab society. I think that it will have um, an influence on turning out the vote. It will increase the, the turning out the votes, especially in the triangle. Uh, I don't know if it was going to work in the Galilee, but people in the triangle are really feeling it so strong because they are the ones who are, uh, you know, threatened. Uh, and in Israel now, you know, today nobody, yes, Eric, nobody speaks about the Trump Netanyahu plan. It seems to me that everybody had forgotten it, you know, um, and it's weird that it, uh, uh, nobody talks. Uh, about it and it seems to be that I don't know if Netanyahu understood that it's not uh, he's not gaining anything from this plan and he will uh, you know skip it right now till after the election maybe Eric can give a, a question for that well, uh, I'm answer for that you want me to relate? You know the uh, the issue of the uh, of the Trump plan, Trump Netanyahu plan. Uh, well, it did pump in some fresh blood to the political campaign, the electoral campaign, uh, a month ago, and it it will play some role, but but. Just to illustrate, I, I know I know it was accepted very in, in, in very you know uh, the, the the public the public fears and 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 then uh, some some cri criticism and uh, and the cynical approach many cynical approach to well the, this will not happen this is unreal uh, the the issue here is and and we know it it is an un, unreal option we had it from from Netanyahu and and Gantz uh, as well the issue here how to how to translate this into a political action and i want to illustrate uh, i want to illustrate i i looked into social media again and uh, there was there was an election rally in Bata'a. Uh, Balta are for those who do not know or do not necessarily know the, the this region. Balta is a divided small Arab village between Israel and Palestine. Balta is well. This is the story of the entire Israeli Arab Israeli conflict, and uh, the Israeli Balta residents well they they are not ready to give up their citizenship, and there was a a an, an election rally. Of the joint list in Barta, and the uh, and the conference hall was packed. The conference hall was packed with participants, uh, meaning that it will, if it if it has some effect, it will create an effect on on the election day. Maybe this will motivate people to go out and vote, and to prove on the ground that well, we are not ready to give up our uh, citizenship. This is the issue here. The political action on, on the election, because the, we know that this option of an annexation of the triangle to, uh, to the, the Palestinians it is not a uh, feasible, feasible uh, option. Although I do not disregard the, the, the fears and the anxiety involved in this issue. Thank you both. We have had a um, packed hour um, thank you to all the attendees who stuck with us. Uh, I think this was very, very interesting and um, we're looking forward to seeing how the next couple of weeks pan out and um, hope that we'll be in the next chapter after, after the results. Thank, thank you. I'm not willing to go to a fourth election. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, thank you so much for your insights and for your hard work. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our uh, conference call for today. Uh, please feel free to reach out with questions. It will be recorded and up on our website soon. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.